Welcome to Windy Night Stories. Tonight's story is by George Manville Fenn. The Ghosts at the Grange. Whether I believe in ghosts, fetches, hobgoblins, table spirits, and the rest of the lights and shades of the supernatural world is a question that we will not stop to discuss. But if these pages should meet the eye of a person who can introduce me to a haunted house, I shall be his debtor. Now, when I say a haunted house, I must place a few stipulations upon my acceptance of that said house, so I will at once state what I want. I want one of those comfortably old-fashioned, furnished, quaint, gabled houses, shut up and deserted on account of supernatural tenants who will not be evicted. A house sacred to dust, spiders, and silence, where the damp has crept in here, and the mildew there, and the dry rot and desolation have fixed their abodes, where the owl hoots and the chimney swallow builds, undisturbed by the cheering fumes of a fire, where the once trim garden is weed-grown and wild, pedestals overturned, moss and ivy rampant, fountains choked, and nature having had it all her own way as she has had it for years. That's the sort of place I want to meet with, one that nobody will take, and when I present myself, the agent will laugh in his sleeve and gladly accept me as tenant on lease for a trivial rent. Yes, the agent will laugh in his sleeve at my folly in taking the place on lease, and eagerly getting the document prepared and signed. But then about the murder once committed in the far chamber, the noises, the rustling of silk dresses, the groans, the spots on the floor, the steps along the passage, the opening and closing doors, and other horrors that have scared people to death? Well, by God's help, and the exercise of a little observation and putting of that and that together, I fancy I could get over those little troubles in time, for if the released souls of Hades, that once strutted upon this world's stage, can come back to perform such pitiful duties as to get in table legs and hats, bang doors, rattle chains, and rustle about of nights, why then let them. And as I have before hinted, I'll try and get used to that part of the trouble. The birds would still be welcome visitants, for I must own to a weakness for the feathered tribe, while on their part I can easily conceive that they would be discriminating in their choice of chimneys. The mildew and damp must, of course, be ousted, along with the dust and dry rot, while, as to the spiders in their works, why, much as their untiring industry and patience must be admired, out they must go. And after all is said and done, I fancy this spider deserves a little better treatment at our hands. As to his character, it is too bad to associate him with such craft and insidiousness. Why, what does the poor thing do but toil hard for its living? and I maintain that friend Arachne is as reputable a member of the insect society as the much-vaunted busy bee. Oh, someone will say, but look at the nasty murdering thing and the poor flies struggling in its net, while the dear bees live upon nectar and honey. Who killed and murdered most willfully all those unfortunate chuckle-headed drones this summer, eh? But to my haunted house once more. What a crusade against rats and mice— what inspecting of old furniture, and sending this to the lumber room, and that to be polished and rubbed up, what choosing of suitable new objects, and fitting up the old-fashioned rooms again, mingling just enough of the modern to add to the comfort of the old, without destroying its delicious quaintness. For I like an old house, with its crooks and corners, and bow-peep passages, and closets, and steps, and ins and outs, wainscots, old pictures, and memories of the past. Why, no one with a thinking apparatus of his own can be dull to such a place for calling up the scenes of the past and trying to trace the old place's history. Then, again, the garden. How glorious to lead to nature her beauties, and only take away the foul and rank, cutting back here and rescuing there, and bringing the neglected place into a charming wilderness, a place that nature has robbed of its old former primness and, setting art at defiance, made it her own. Yes, if someone will kindly put me in the way of getting to such a place for a residence, I shall be his or her debtor, while for recompense, as soon as ever matters have been a bit seen to, and the place is habitable, they shall have the honor of first sleeping in the most haunted room in the house. This is, I am well aware, a very choice kind of house, but that there are such places everyone is aware, 
and my story is to be about one of those old man-forsaken spots that years ago existed in Hertfordshire. I say years ago existed, for though the house still stands, it is in a dreadfully modernized form. Wings were pulled down, wainscotings torn out, and the place so altered that a tenant was found, and the haunters so disgusted with their home that the noises ceased, and the old reputation was forgotten. I write this story as it was told to me by a friend, in whose word I have faith sufficient to vouch for the truth of what he heard. There was an old legend attached to the place, something relating to the right of possession, and someone coming home to oust the then holder of the estate. Then followed midnight murder, the concealment of the deed, and, it is said, the spirits of the murderer and murdered haunted the scene of the dread deed. Be that as it may, family after family took the house and left in a very short time. Strange noises were heard. Strange stories got about the village. Servants at first could only be sent from one room to the other in twos and threes for mutual protection. Jane fell down in a fit. Mary was found staring, with her eyes fixed on nothingness, and her mouth wide open. Betsy was lost, but afterward found in the best bedroom, with the whole of her person buried beneath the clothes, when she struggled and screamed horribly at their being dragged off. Cooks number one, two, three, four, and five used to go about after dark with their aprons over their heads. Mary Hand could not sleep alone. Thomas said nothing, but took to wearing his hair standing on end like quills upon the fretful etc., or better still, in this case, like a hedgehog. And all ended by giving notice one after the other so fast that at last it came to a fresh servant reaching the village, hearing the character of the house, and then going back without even testing the place, for, like a snowball, the horror said to abound, increased at a fearful ratio when slipping glibly off rumors many tongues. At last the house stood empty year after year. The agent who was empowered to let it did his best. House hunters came, looked at it, asked questions, and then, after a few inquiries, house hunters went, and the house stood empty when, as season after season passed, the forlorn aspect of the place became worse. The paint peeled off the window frames. The gutters rotted. Green mold settled upon the doors. Grass grew up between the steps, while the large slab was raised right out of its place by the growth of fungus. Idle boys threw stones at the windows, and then ran for their lives. Shutters came loose and flapped about, while neglect and ruin were everywhere, and the house was said to be more haunted than ever. Fortunately, the Grange was the property of a wealthy man, who did not feel the loss of the rent, and as time wore on, the place was known as the haunted house, and no attempt was made to let it, so that it became at last almost untenable. At length the new agent came to the neighboring town, and after a few months' stay, his curiosity became aroused, and being a quite sensible fellow, he talked to first one acquaintance and then the other, heard the story of the haunted house from different sources, and the upstart was that a party of half a dozen, of whom my friend was one, agreed to sit up with the agent in the ghostly place, and try and investigate the matter, so as to place the strange rumors in a better light, if possible. The night fixed upon came, and well provided with creature comforts, the party adjourned to the Grange. Mr. Hampson, the agent, having been in the afternoon, and having seen that a supply of fuel was placed ready, and at the same time had done all he could towards making what had evidently been a little breakfast room comfortable. On reaching the hall door, the snow was falling heavily, while a sad moaning wind swept round the house, and blew the large flakes in the unwanted visitors' faces. Dreary and dismal looked the old Elizabethan Grange, and more than one of the venturesome party felt a shiver, perhaps of cold, pass through him as a large key was thrust into the lock, and with a groan the door turned upon its hinges. Mr. Hemson had brought with him a bull's-eye dark lantern, and now turning it on, the party found themselves in a small square hall with a wide staircase in front, and about three doors on either side. All looked gloomy and weird, while a sensation of chill fell upon one and all as they passed across the earthy-smelling place, followed Mr. Henson down a few stairs to the right, and then stood in the little breakfast room where a few sparks yet remained of the large fire that had been built. 
Every man had come loaded and ready for passing a cold winter's night in the forsaken house, and soon candles were lit, a large fire was roaring up the chimney, and a cloth having been spread over an old table, spirit bottles, glasses, lemons, and sugar, all tended towards making the room a little more cheering, while, in spite of dust and cobwebs, there was some very good furniture about the place. "'Choose wood-seat chairs, gentlemen,' said Mr. Hemson, "'for everything is terribly damp.' The advice was followed, after closing the shutters, and bringing down a cloud of dust in the performance. Glasses round became the order of the night, and whether for the sake of getting Dutch courage or not, I cannot say, but Holland's gin was a favored spirit. After this refresher, candles were trimmed, the lantern turned on, and beginning with the cellars, a careful investigation of the place was made, walls were tapped, fastenings tried, shutters shaken, and all perfectly satisfied that no one but themselves was in or could gain entrance to the place. Go where they would, there was the same dull, damp, methetic odor, dust and cobwebs, and mildew everywhere. But for these traces of the lapse of time, the place might have been left but a few weeks or months. The rooms were well furnished, good carpets were down, the library shelves were full of books, and ornaments upon the chimney pieces. In the drawing room was an old square pianoforte, while from every wall gloomy and dark faces looked down upon the intruders. And thus the tour of the house was completed, not a closet even being left unscanned, while as they left each room the keys were turned, and at length, joking and laughing, they returned to the comparatively snug room, and assembled round the fire. Now, said my friend, presuming that we have come here to listen for the strange sounds that are heard, what course are we to adopt in the event of anything taking our attention? Not much fear, laughed one. Then let's have a little smoke and a song, said another. But really, said Mr. Hempson, I think we ought to do something, gentlemen, for, mind you, I for one fully expect that we shall hear some strange noises. And what I want is for us to find out what it is, and see if we can't stop it for the future. Did you bring any holy water, Hempson? said one of the party. Come, come, gentlemen, said my friend. Business, business. Now, I tell you what. We will all sit here, and of course the first man who thinks he hears a sound will advise the others. Then we will all go together and try and find out what it was, but in silence, mind. No man is to speak till we get back to this room, when here is paper and you have most of you pencils. Let each man write down what impression that which he has seen and heard made upon him, writing it down in as few words as possible, so we can compare impressions, and there will not be, as is often the case, one person modeling his ideas upon those of another. Very good, I second that, said Mr. Hempson, while, after a few remarks, first one and then the other agreed that the plan would be excellent. Ten, eleven, struck by the old church clock, and the wind roared about the old place, rumbling in the chimney and sending snow with its soft pats against the window panes, so that more than once a member of the party started and looked round. But the warm glow of the fire, the social cheer, and perhaps, more than all, the spirits, tended to drive away any dread that might otherwise have taken possession of those present, and the night wore on. Twelve struck by the old church clock, and the wind lulled. Now is the witching... What's the rest of it? said one of the party. Ah, said another... Now is the ghostly time. Don't you wish you were at home, Henson? said another. Not I, said the agent. I'm perfectly cool so far. Well, I'm not, said the first speaker, for my shins are scorching. Pass the kettle this way, said my friend, and... Hush! exclaimed Mr. Hempson, and a dead silence fell upon the group. Well, what is it? said my friend, holding his glass to the kettle spout. I fancied I heard a noise, said Mr. Hempson while all listened attentively. Pooh, said my friend, the wind. And he then filled up his glass and placed it upon the table. But the next moment he started up. Well, what now? said Mr. Hempson. Didn't you hear that? exclaimed my friend. No, what? said Mr. Hempson. Why, that noise. There, he exclaimed. And now every man started to his feet, having distinctly heard some sounds proceeding from the direction of the hall. Hush, be quiet whispered Mr. Hempson, hastily examining his lantern. Now then, follow me. And all hastily pressed up the few steps, 
and stood in the hall listening to the sound as of someone talking in the room right in front, the dining room. The hall was quite dark, save where the light from the breakfast parlor shone out and cast a long streak upon the dining room door. While there, each man holding his breath, and armed as they were with stout walking sticks, pokers, or whatever came to their reach, the party stood listening as the loud utterances of some voice reached their ears, succeeded by various noises, as if there were some occupant of the room. "'Now then,' whispered Mr. Hempson, "'are you all ready?' "'Yes,' was the response. Mr. Hempson turned on his dark lantern, almost with one movement turned key and handle, threw open the door, and as every man rushed in, the light was flashed all over the room, but no one was visible. There stood the old-fashioned dining chairs formally against the walls. The pictures looked down grimly, the wine cooler beneath the sideboard yawned gloomily and black, but nothing more could be seen. Not even a chair was out of place, though every eye was now directed to a large closet in one corner. "'Come along, gentlemen,' said Mr. Hemson, and he swung the door of the empty closet open. "'But the tablecloth,' whispered my friend, pointing to the large dust-covered cloth whose corners touched the floor. To whisk off the great pall white cloth from the long dining table was but the work of an instant, and then the light was flashed under the table, but nothing save a cloud of penetrating dust rewarded the searchers, who then stood, pale and puzzled, looking at each other, till Mr. Hempson proposed an adjournment to the little room where, after carefully locking the dining-room door, they retook their places, every man feeling uncomfortable and put out. But the attention was soon drawn by my friend to the arrangement agreed upon, when pencils were eagerly seized, and for a quarter of an hour not a word was spoken when the last man laid down his pencil. "'Has every man signed his name?' asked my friend. This caused another trifling delay, for no man had placed his name at the bottom of his manuscript, but this being done, the first man's paper was read over. It was, of course, very brief, but to the effect that, while standing in the hall, he had heard the sound as of a man talking to himself in a wild, agitated manner, that it had seemed that a book was thrown hastily down upon the table by someone, who then hurriedly pushed his chair back, so that it scraped along the floor, while at the same time the table gave way and cracked audibly. Then followed the hurry pacing of someone up and down the room, till the door was thrown open and all became silent. "'Precisely what I have stated,' exclaimed Mr. Hempson. "'Mine is almost word for word the same,' cried my friend, while, with trifling exceptions, the narratives of the other watchers tallied. Rather pale and uncomfortable, the party now sat talking in whispers, starting at every loud gust of wind or loud pat of snow on the window, while the rattling of casement or door was enough to send a shiver through the stoutest man present. But as the night wore on and nothing more alarming was heard, first one and then the other dropped off to sleep, though the majority sat watching till the cold gray light of the winter's morning dawned, and then, after another glance at the dining room, now looking more weird than ever, as seen by the light streaming through the round, eye-like holes in the window shutters, the party gladly left the house, and doubtless made the best of their way to bed. Now, I make no defense of this story, for I have placed it upon paper in pretty much the same form it was told to me. What the noises that the convivial watchers heard I cannot say, but though I consider my informant worthy of credence, and though it was singular that the impression made on all was the same, yet I cannot help thinking that the best thing to imbibe while sitting up at night is tea. The End